So I first heard about John R. Brinkley when I lived in Kansas, and um, my mother-in-law and father-in-law were living near Milford, Kansas, and they had been born in Kansas in about 1918, 1917, and grew up there. And so they started talking about the goat gland doctor and telling me stories about a guy who had been a physician in that very town in Milford, Kansas, and how he had built up a huge empire, and his whole business was based on transplanting the testicles of goats from goats into humans in an effort to restore the virility of human males. And at the time, I was working on my PhD in genetics, and I thought, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be making this up. And subsequently, uh, the story of John R. Brinkley um, has always fascinated me, and I've read several books on it. He's really quite an amazing guy, and he's um, changed the history of medical practice as we know it. So the story of John R. Brinkley starts in 1917, when he is the house doctor at a Swift Meatpacking Company, which is located in Kansas. And he noticed that the, the goats that they were bringing to the slaughterhouse were vigorously mating, even as they were being loaded into the trucks to be sent to the slaughterhouse. And a few years later, after he went into private practice in Milford, Kansas, there was a farmer named Stitzworth who came to see him, and he complained about his sagging libido. He was no longer able to keep up with his the sexual needs of his younger wife. So the doctor, Dr. Brinkley, um, recalled the goats, the randy nature of the goats, and he semi-jokingly told his patient that what he needed was goat testicles, goat glands. And Stitzworth quickly re responded, so doc, put them in, transplant them. So he went ahead and did this surgery. So where, where was it, how did Brinkley get credentials? How was he certified to become a doctor? So between 1907 and 1915, he went to various um, medical schools. So he went to the Bennett Medical College of Chicago and the Eclectic Medical University of Kansas City, who you may remember from being the eclectic naturopathy kind of style of medicine. Um, so these were essentially diploma mills. You would go to these things, and if you did even a reasonable amount of work, they would issue you a diploma so you could go out and practice medicine. But he didn't even finish these schools. So in spite of these dubious credentials, he was licensed by Kansas and set up his medical practice in Milford, Kansas. Before he came to Milford, Kansas, he had worked as a snake oil salesman in a road show, and then with a Chicago con man named James Crawford, he established the Greenville Electromedical Doctors. So that, this was in the early days of electricity, and there were lots of electrical medical treatments that they would give to you. So under this name, they would inject people with colored distilled water for $25 a shot, and then promised that those injections were going to treat your ailments. So he decided to capitalize on this farmer's idea of goat gland transplant. And in a, in a way, goat glands followed the, the law of signatures. That was something that people have been believing since the days of the Greek and the Romans, and the Renaissance physicians, the Middle Ages, because the goats themselves had such a high sexual um, appetite, then it made sense that goat testicles should be transplanted into humans. Now, you would think, if you got this to work, wh what would this do to your ordinary testicles? So you've really got to wonder about the surgery. He was very unethical, and he had a very wobbly knowledge of medicine. And he had witnessed the behavior of goats, and goats were notorious for having a high sex drive. And he understood advertising. And he also knew that beginning in Europe in the late 1800s, 
there had been a, a tradition of testicle transplants for impotence. So the way that Brinkley appealed to people to have this surgery was that he would say, this procedure was, oh, everybody needed this operation, but the procedure was most suited to people who were intelligent, and it was least suited to the stupid type. So that meant if you uh, rejected the Gokulan treatment, then maybe you were stupid. So if you didn't benefit from the treatment, um, you couldn't admit it, because if you admitted that it wasn't beneficial, you were basically saying you were stupid. And in fact, you were stupid if you got a goat gland transplanted into you. So the people were often embarrassed by these problems as well, so they didn't go and get a second opinion and talk to other more ethical doctors. So his fame became quite, um, quite considerable. He had large um, fields of caged goats. He had all kinds of goats that were going to be transplanted. And as he became more and more fa famous, the medical community really rejected what he was doing. So Morris Fishbein, the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is a journal, a prestigious journal that's still being published, called Brinkley a smooth-tongued charlatan and urged the Kansas authorities to revoke his right to practice medicine, which brings up the point that your, your medical license is pretty much issued by a state. There isn't a federal medical license. That's really something states do. So if you move from state to state, um, you have to be considered to get another license. And a lot of, once you're licensed in one state, it's usually easier to get a license in the next state, but not, not always. So Brinkley's assertion that his procedure worked on, on um, impotence he also said it worked on insanity, it cured acne, it worked against influenza and high blood pressure. So it was pretty much quackery. And so Brinkley called the American Medical Association, or the AMA, the Meat Cutters Union, and charged that the AMA was jealous of him because they were losing business because of his great treatments. So Lots of stories and press releases went into the nation's newspaper. They portrayed him as a medical maverick, the great friend of the suffering aging male Americans, a victim of persecution from generous ethical doctors. And remember, we had talked about ethical medicine. And he portrayed himself as a devout family man and Christian. He was deeply religious. He, he was, his uh, idol was the Dr. Apostle Luke, um, of the Gospels. He was um, a Greek physician and they said, he said, they called Luke a quack too, for he did not belong to the American Medical Association. So he went to California to perform a transplant on Harry Chandler, who was the owner of the LA Times. And Chandler decided this had worked, so he rewarded Brinkley with lots of free publicity. And when Brinkley was in California, he learned about the potential of radio. And so returning home in 1923, he started a radio station. And this was in the early days of popular radio. So he called it KFKB, Kansas First, Kansas Best. And so it was a thousand watt station, which was a, a lot of wattage at the time. And he broadcast music. He broadcast lectures on rejuvenation. He had political features. And he had something called the medical question box. And he himself would go live on the radio and answer the listeners' questions. So it was one of radio's earliest advice shows. So he was really a pioneer in broadcasting in Kansas. And because he had such a powerful signal, KFKB became the nation's most popular radio station was heard all over the Midwest and sometimes on either coast. And he would give people a prescription over, over um, the radio and then he would assign them a number and then they could go get that filled at a local pharmacy. He set up a national Dr. Brinkley Pharmaceutical Association and he had pharmacists who were selling water colored with indigo as a treatment. And Kansas State University 
even offered courses. Kansas State University is very close to Milford. So he became an immensely wealthy man. And so for $5,000, he would even implant genuine human testicles. And he would obtain those from prisoners on death row. He had mansions, he had a fleet of Cadillac cars, he had airplanes, which it was very popular in the in the 20s and the 30s to fly your own airplane. Um, and there was lots of flat land in Kansas for landing fields. He had yachts, where presumably he went and took his plane somewhere to be on a yacht. And the pharmacist was, would kick back a dollar per prescription. So he was conservatively estimated to be making t half a million dollars a year, every year, and for the rest of his career. And the drugs that he was selling, this kind of indigo-colored water, was so lucrative that it almost sidelined the goat glands. So the American Medical Association finally convinced the Kansas Board of Medical Registration that they had to revoke Brinkley's license on the grounds of immorality and unprofessional conduct. They said, he's immoral, you know, he's transplanting these glands, that's just inappropriate. But Brinkley would not give in. He claimed he was being crucified by the authorities, and he hired other licensed physicians to work in his hospital, and he kept his hospital going in Milford, Kansas. And so, in particular, the American Medical Association hated the radio scam with the prescriptions. So in 1930, the Federal Radio Commission denied his request for the renewal of his radio license. They basically pulled his license because of his advertising and prescription drugs. And he appealed on the grounds of censorship. And the U.S. Court of Appeals denied his appeal. And then the court ruled that the Federal Radio Commission could consider past programming content without it being censorship. So they weren't trying to censor his future stuff, they were looking at what, what he'd been up to. So then Brinkley went to Mexico and set up a Mexican radio station. So he brought in one of the largest radio transmitters ever, a 100,000 watt XER in Mexico, twice the power of any broadcast radio station. And so for many years, the Food and Drug Administration forbid pharmaceutical ads on the TV or the radio because of Brinkley's abuses. And even now, when there's pharmaceutical ads for drugs, they're really supposed to be informational ads where they tell you, see your doctor about whether or not you need a prescription. They aren't allowed to say, take this drug, you know, buy it, and then go get it and it will solve all your problems. So Brinkley was not done. Even though they had taken his radio station away, he would responded with his Mexican radio station, and he decided that the only way he was going to get um, to keep doing his very well compensated business was to run for governor of Kansas. So he wasn't very popular with the Republicans or the Democrats. So what he did was he ran a write-in campaign using his radio station to generate publicity because he was the guy with the good radio station. So the nation was entering the Depression. They were very mistrustful of all politicians, Republicans, Democrats. They were all letting him down. And so Brinkley became a populist, and a lot of people voted for him. He held rallies all around the state of Kansas. He would bring out preachers and country musicians. Um, he arrived in a private plane. He'd walk through a cheering crowd to the accompaniment of a brass band. He would sit on the podium and then make outrageous promises to the Kansans. He promised things that, frankly, weren't bad ideas. He promised free school books, free clinics, medical aid. You would get public medicine. Of course, it would be his medicine, which was indigo dyed water and goat gland transplants, but still it was medicine, and uh, pensions for the elderly. So he anticipated the idea of Social Security. And he was too late to register to be on the ballot as an independent, and he had to lead the crowds 
who many of whom were illiterate, in spelling out his name for the writing column. J R B R I N K L E Y. So on election day, he had 183,278 valid write-in votes, and he ended up in third place. And he was about 34,000 votes behind the victorious Democrat, Harry Woodring. But tens of thousands of votes were voided because of technicality, mostly spelling. And the Republican and Democratic politicians privately conceded that they that the man they figured wasn't going to have but a few thousand write-ins probably could have been elected if his name had actually appeared on the ballot. And my favorite part, he even picked up 20,000 write-in votes and carried three counties in Oklahoma. So the people were listening to the advertisements that he was running for governor, and those people voted for him even though they were living in Oklahoma because they liked his platform. So even bad doctors can have an influence on how we practice medicine today. So in the 20th century, there were a series of major pharmaceutical breakthroughs that occurred. And with each of these major pharmaceutical breakthroughs, physicians changed in their roles from being people who were primarily diagnosticians who would tell you how long you had to live or just have careful nursing and what was the likelihood that you would recover from this ailment, to being physicians who could write a prescription for a drug that would actually cure you. So the practice of medicine in the 20th century transformed from being the art of medicine to being the science of medicine. And even with medicine being a science, it's still a bit of an art but it's much more scientific now than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. So one of the first drugs of the 20th century was invented by Dr. Paul Ehrlich, and he invented an arsenic-based compound called Salverson, and he called this treatment chemotherapy. So he originated the idea of chemical therapy or chemotherapy, and Salverson was an effective treatment for syphilis which, as I've mentioned a couple times, was really quite common. And um, if you had syphilis infection, it could lead to uh, madness and death. So around the 1920s, uh, a physician named Banting, working with a, a, a medical student named Best, discovered and began the manufacture of insulin to treat diabetes. And in the 30s, and uh, Arthur uh, Fleming discovered penicillin, which acted as an antibiotic. And then during the 1940s, during World War II, Flory and a series of other physicians and pharma pharmacists uh, developed a way of manufacturing penicillin in large amounts so that they could have act active treatment against the injuries of war. And so penicillin was very rare at the beginning of World War II and was used quite extensively once they figured out how to manufacture it to prevent battlefield infections. And it's thought to have saved um, tens of thousands of lives during World War II. Plus, it was actually a pretty effective treatment for syphilis. So a big breakthrough in antibiotic treatment came about when streptomycin was um, isolated from a, a fungus. And streptomycin was affecting it against tuberculosis, which had been the scourge of the 19th century. It had been in decline in the 20th century, but tuberculosis continues to be one of the top 10 killers around the world. Unfortunately, tuberculosis has become, uh, to a large extent, resistant to drugs like streptomycin. But, and you need complicated mixtures of drugs to prevent antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis. Um, in the 1950s, there was a miracle drug called cortisone, and cortisone and other kinds of derivatives of it were steroid hormones that could suppress the immune system response and are used um, for a lot of treatments. 
they couldn't give it to you constantly because of the side effects, but in a short treatment, it can be used to um, excellent response. So in the 1950s, Salk and Sabin, um, in sequence, developed a vaccine against polio. Um, Salk used uh, a killed virus, and Sabin used a, an attenuated or weakened virus. And other vaccines were developed against measles and mump and rubella, um, diphtheria vaccines, tetanus vaccines, um, vaccines against um, hepatitis B virus were developed, and now human papillomavirus has a vaccine against it, which helps prevent um, risk of cancer of the cervix. And so these polio vaccines and other vaccines are, again, one of the major pharmaceutical breakthroughs of the, the 20th century. Another big breakthrough in the 1950s, which became popular in the 1960s, was understanding how steroid hormones work and the development of estrogen into and progesterone into oral contraceptives, which became known as the pill or birth control pills. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a worldwide campaign to eradicate smallpox through vaccination, and it's still considered to be one of the great medical successes of the 20th century, the actual eradication of a human disease. Um, in the 1970s, uh, and going back a little bit further, there were a lot of developments of chemotherapy drugs for treating cancer. And then by the 80s and even 90s, there was the idea of combining different chemotherapy drugs, um, multiple drugs, to prevent cancer from coming back. So combination drug therapy uh, turned out to be one of the important breakthroughs in chemotherapy. So another big breakthrough of the 20th century were antiviral drugs. There had been antibiotics to treat um, bacteria, and there had been drugs, anti-parasite drugs, to treat um, infections like malaria, but there hadn't been effective treatments against viral diseases until drugs like acyclovir were um, developed. So HIV AIDS um, became a serious disease one of the, a serious disease that had not been seen in humans before the 20th century. And so in the 1980s, individuals um, began catching this very virulent um, disease, which suppressed their immune system. And then they would die of either opportunistic infections or cancer of, that would normally have been fought off by your immune system. So. HIV was identified as a retrovirus, so it was a virus that um, made a copy of itself. It was an RNA virus that made a copy to become a DNA virus. And so they, they identified different treatments against the, the retrovirus aspect of the HIV. And from being a disease where as many as 90% um, of the people were expected to die within a few years, the survival rates of the HIV patients grew rapidly. And they took a, the idea of chemotherapy drugs for cancer, where they made a, a multi-drug cocktail and gave that, that to people so the cancer cells couldn't become resistant to the chemotherapy. They used the idea that the HIV drugs could be given in combination in lower doses so that the HIV virus would not mutate and develop resistance to just one particular drug. So it increased the number of people living with the disease by 28% between 1996 and the year 2000. And hospitalization rates fell by 32% in this period of time. And in more recent years, hospitalization rates for HIV have continued to fall. And between 2002 and 2007, the rates fell from 35 per 100 HIV patients to 27 per 100 patients, a drop of 
So in the the early days of the AIDS epidemic, before those antiretroviral treatments, or ART, were available, the median survival after an AIDS diagnosis was measured in weeks to months. And patient care was confined to treating the opportunistic infections and treating the cancers that arose from the HIV. By the, so in comparison, 20 years later, when somebody is infected with HIV today and they follow the therapy, they can predict that this individual will live at least an additional 50, ye 50 years, which is close to the normal life expectancy. So this isn't a cure for HIV AIDS, but it's an, it's an effective treatment. And HIV AIDS is, is, I think, fourth in the list of the World Health Organization killer diseases. And one of the big advances of pharmaceutical treatment in the 20th century has been allowing patents for drugs for HIV AIDS to not be applied to uh, individuals in Africa and in India and around the developing world so that even though people are poor, they can access these drugs and try and prevent death from HIV. So one other change in drugs in the 20th century has been the development of what could be called elective drugs. So these are drugs that are not required to save your life. They're not required to prolong your life. They're just required to um, potentially improve the quality of your life. So you can elect to take them or not take them, depending on whether or not you think it would be beneficial for you. So one of the first elective drugs was Rogaine, which it was sort of a, a drug that was being developed as a blood pressure remedy. And people found that it wasn't a very great blood pressure remedy because it had the side effect of, of encouraging hair growth. And then somebody thought, well, maybe hair growth is a good thing. And so they treated um, individual scalp topically with the Rogaine. And for a number of people, quite a significant number of people, there was hair regrowth. So a treatment for balding um, individuals was something that people wanted. So you could go and get a prescription for it. Or now you can even buy it over the counter. So attention deficit disorder um, where people lack the ability to focus in school was treated by Ritalin. Um, people who have trouble sleeping could take a safe, effective sleeping drug like Ambien or Lunesta. Um, individuals who have erectile dysfunction could take a drug that would enable them to have more successful sexual um, encounters, a drug called Viagra. And there's a number of other drugs similar to it. And if you had um, unsightly nail fungus, you could take a drug called Lamisil. And you're not going to die because you have hair loss or nail fungus or even have trouble sleeping. But if you could take a, a medication for those dr drugs, um, you might elect to do that. So in since 2004, there have been a whole new um, bunch of drugs in the biopharmaceutical pipeline. So new classes, new categories of, of drugs have been coming out since 2004. So this is a slide put together by the Food and Drug Administration looking at innovation. So um, anti-angiogenic medicine for cancers arose um, in those are drugs that repress the blood vessel growing capability of cancer. When you have a tumor, it requires additional blood flow in order to grow. And so they used um, treatments that repress the blood, blood vessel building capability of tumors. So there were new kidney cancer drugs developed, new therapies for diabetes, new prescriptions for chronic chest pain, um, the first vaccine for the prevention of cervical cancer by fighting human papillomavirus. Um, a once-a-day HIV medicine was developed in 2006. Um, new classes of medicines to treat high blood pressure, 
new treatments for fibromyalgia, which turn out to be some of the best-selling drugs currently, um, new types of treatments for Crohn's disease, new prescriptions for symptoms of Huntington's disease, um, new treatment for peripheral T-cell lymphoma, new prescriptions for gout, new prescriptions for multiple sclerosis, therapeutic vaccines against prostate cancer, some of the first new drugs against lupus, two new hepatitis C drugs, which offer better chances for cures of hepatitis C, and several other new personalized medicines that are based on ideas from the Human Genome Project. And in 2012, there were 43 new drugs approved, and the first drug was developed to target the root cause of cystic fibrosis, a genetic disease. And now in 2013, there's over 5,000 medicines in development globally. So there's, a, there's been a, a lot of innovation, mostly due to um, understanding of causes of, of diseases brought about by the Human Genome Project. So with all these new medical advances, do people still use alternative forms of medicine? And in fact, in 1997, Americans made 627 million visits to practitioners of alternative medicine and spent as much as $27 billion of their own money. They were not recompensed by insurance money to pay for alternative therapies. And so that includes chiropractic. When they include alternative therapies, they're including chiropractic, where people have spinal adjustments. And in contrast, Americans only made 386 million visits to their family doctor. So it's thought that one in every two persons in the United States between the ages of 35 and 49 are using at least one alternative therapy in 1997. And that these alternative medicines are growing in popularity, not declining in popularity. So the trend has been for people to um, want to take alternative medicines. A lot of the alternative medicines that people are taking are dietary supplements. So this was aided, in fact, by an act called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. And under this act, dietary supplements can have structure function claims without being reviewed by the FDA. In other words, somebody can sell an herbal remedy and make claims as to what that herbal remedy is going to do. Um, so they, they can't really say that they prevent, treat, cure, mitigate, or diagnose disease without FDA review, but they can make claims that they affect your, your structure or function. So for example, one popular herbal remedy is something called St. John's wort. So you can claim that St. John's wort will help alleviate um, poor moods and a bunch of other things, but they can't say it's going to necessarily um, prevent depression. So this Dietary Supplement Act, where um, lots of drugs were now able to be sold as treatments, was a huge boon for the supplement makers. And in fact, these drugs are a big business. Um, so this supplement industry exploded in the, in the 1990s and the 2000s. Huge increases in sales huge um, product uh, advances. And so the, by 2007, it's a $23.7 billion industry. And there's a lot of lax regulation of these supplements. So for example, some individuals marketed an industrial level chelator as an antioxidant supplement for the treatment of autism before the FDA finally acted. So these supplements then are, um, they're widely available. And some of them are things like fish oil capsules or cinnamon capsules 
or other kinds of um, supplements for uh, powdered soybeans that are muscle builders. So various casein as a milk protein, as a muscle supplement. So some of these supplements are kind of food-based or herbal-based and are probably not very harmful and may even have some benefits. When people do studies, they can even find some benefits for some of these supplements like fish oil or cinnamon. But other supplements have risk. So one of the problems has been people were taking ephedra. So ephedra is something that can lead to spikes in blood pressure and it was leading to um, a toxic response when sports figures would take this ephedra in as a stimulant for tiredness. And so individuals were keeling over. They would take these supplements and then go out and exercise hard on the football field and then keel over and die. So um, there was an effort to pass a Dietary Supplement Safety Act to make dietary supplements safer, but the Senate was unable to pass it. So these energy drinks continue to be largely unregulated, although there are some risks undoubtedly for taking large amounts of um, ephedra and then exercising. So some of these supplements may work by something known as the placebo effect. Um, so the idea is that most illnesses are self-limiting and get better on your own. So it, the famous saying is, you know, when you have a cold, it'll either get better in a week or seven days, whichever comes first. So you don't need to necessarily observe the restraints of reputable medicine when you're giving a supplement. Um, you can oversimplify this and when the ailment is self-limiting you can make nature your ally. So individuals then um, can give you a remedy for a cold and as long as it doesn't do you a lot of harm you may feel like it's making you feel better so as long as you think it's making you feel better, uh, you're not necessarily, uh, you're going to keep buying that remedy. So these nutraceuticals then are an even bigger market where people say, you know, eat a high fiber or a low fat. Uh, so these nutraceuticals then are an even bigger product market. So they can sell those things without testing if they're effective and there aren't large cries of outrage. So the placebo effect is used to argue that it's doing no harm since if you believe it's working and you feel better taking a supplement you should be free to do that. So Americans spend as much on over-the-counter drugs and nutraceuticals as they do s seeing the doctor. And if you read the eclectic medicine text that we talked about earlier you're going to discover many illnesses they couldn't treat are now curable and as still people long for the good old days and cite this as traditional medicine and something you should be allowed to take. So in addition to those kinds of nutraceuticals there's other physicians known as naturopathy. So the naturopathies actually go to a naturopathic school and in certain um, in certain states you can be licensed as a doctor of naturopathy. I don't believe you can in West Virginia. So the naturopathies talk about balance and vitality and harmony with the body. They talk about optim optimal health or supporting the body. All these of which are vague terms that can't really be objectively measured or scientifically tested. So for example when you have an infection um, it depends on your degree of exposure to an infectious organism, the virulence of the organism infecting you, and the body's ability to resist. So you don't need to be toxic or imbalanced in order to catch a cold. You have to be exposed to a sufficiently large dose of a sufficiently toxic uh, virus or bacteria in order to catch a cold. So some diseases are an inevitable result of your genetic makeup and other diseases have very little to do with heredity. So the general concept is that you'll treat the system by strengthening the immune system 
you'll take a supplement so you'll fight off disease. But this clashes with the fact that some conditions are allergies or, or autoimmune diseases. And in those cases, the immune system is overreactive. So strengthening your immune system is not an overall do-all, cure-all for individuals. So this natural health movement advocates self-care as opposed to reliance on professional caregivers. And it emphasizes natural healing therapies and prevention and healthy lifestyles. And there's a lot to be said for aspects of the natural health movement. Um, so many people who eat a vegetarian diet, for example, as part of a natural health movement, um, reduce their risk of heart disease or cancer because they're consuming um, less animal protein and less animal lipids, which can have harmful effects. But And there's nothing about natural health that prevents its alternate treatments from being used alongside conventional medical treatment. And so that's one of the things that people are in traditional Western medicine are doing they're, but they're also wanting to know exactly what natural health remedies you're using so they can find out if some of those supplements that you're taking will have a negative interaction with the traditional um, Western medical treatments that you're taking. So the natural health movement includes the health food grocery stores, herbalism, naturopathy, natural health websites, natural hygiene, natural cures, naturopathy, self-care health books, and vitamin and supplement dealers. So you can go to drugstore supplement companies when you go to the shopping mall. So we'll talk more in the next lecture about um, how the Western medicine works and how it's introduced. So. Thanks for your attention.